Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, What are the commercial determinants of cancer control policy? It's a long title and seemingly complex, but indeed, if we all want to win against cancer, but if we don't control these commercial determinants, we won't be able to win. What are the commercial determinants? Well, they actually arise in the context of the provisions of goods and services for payment. And that also includes, of course, the commercial activities and, and their environments. And I guess most of you will think instantly of tobacco, the production, the sales, the, the marketing, advertisement of tobacco control, of contra tobacco, con tobacco products and alcohol, of course, you know, and how we try or not try to control these determinants effectively. But the commercial determinants of cancer control go way beyond substances and products of uh, consumption. They are also part of the entire care uh, continuum of the health system. Like, for example, we are trying to introduce evidence-based screening, but very often, you know, they compete with not really very effective or sometimes um, even harmful screenings for, for cancer. And then they take the same space, they take the same capacity, and they take the same resources we actually need for the effective ones. And non-pharmaceutical interventions, think about all the e-health, m-health, i-health application, artificial intelligence, new surgery um, intervention, and we very often know that they have very little meaningful benefits, while others, which are really helpful, don't get the attention and the money it needs to. And the same for, in a similar way, actually, pharmaceutical innovations. How often do we complain that we give a lot of money and attention to Me Too products, but the ones that really make a difference are very difficult to finance? And I think I could go on like this, actually, for forever, but I think this ask, number one, for a couple of ethical questions, but also for better governance. There's a need for an effective system of checks and balances on the market forces. And I think this is something which we are going to discuss um, uh, today here in this webinar. This webinar is really very, very special for us, first of all, because it's a joint webinar between WHO and the Observatory. It's not the first joint webinar, but we always enjoy to work with our colleagues. And it's not just um, uh, Copenhagen, where we usually have our collaboration, but also I'm very happy to um, to invite colleagues from um, uh, headquarters in Geneva and from China, actually. Second, um, we um, will launch today the EuroHealth special issues on the commercial determinants of cancer control policy. And um, that, is, that is a very special thing because it's a, a journal which features short and sharp to the point articles addressing European uh, policymakers. And I'm sure you will you will enjoy reading these articles. So the short presentations to you will give you a little bit of a flavor what you find inside. And also I'm very happy to say that we have two of the guest editors and some of the authors with us today. So the keynotes will be delivered by the guest editors, Marilis Korbex from WHO Euro and Monica Kosenska from WHO headquarters. And the spotlight speakers are Gaudin Galea, who is the head of the WHO representative office in China. And we have two fine academics with us, Stuart Hoggart from the University of Cambridge and Richard Sullivan from King's College London. I also should be mentioning that this is only the first installment because this is such an important topic. We will have a second webinar, which will focus much more on the policy, on the politics and on the governance. And for that purpose, we will invite the two other additional guest editors, Tit Albrecht from the National Institute for Public Health of Slovenia and Jose Maria Martin Moreno from Medical School Valencia. So just for the housekeeping, please, everybody, use the chat box, put in your questions, comments, issues, and my colleague, Erica Richardson, she will then feed this back at the end of the uh, session to the panel discussion, to the panelists. Also, please be aware that this session is being recorded. And uh, last but not least, as I said, we are launching the EuroHealth special issue. So download, read, and now before we start with the keynote, I would like to ask my colleague Erica 
for the poll. Erica, please. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Yes, just to uh, get a quick idea of where we are as a as a as an audience, I recognise many familiar names in the lineup, and so welcome everybody. But we just want to do a quick poll. So, Annalisa, if you could launch the poll, please. So, just a couple of questions. So, first of all, in your country, are the commercial determinants of cancer prevention widely recognised? Uh, that's just a straightforward yes or no. But then the second question gets into a little bit more of the nitty gritty. So which commercial determinants of cancer control are being tackled in your country so is that is the focus on alcohol and tobacco control control of other carcinogens uh, is screening uh, taken into account cancer medicines non-pharmaceutical treatments um, or indeed palliative care or none of the above so um, second question you can answer for all of them if you like a couple uh, multiple choices, uh, multiple answers possible. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll give you the results after the keynote speech. Thank you. That's great, Erica. Thank you so much. And I'm quite curious about the, the results and uh, what are the experience of our audience. So this is the moment where I would like to um, in, invite um, Marilis and Monica to start off with their um, keynote to give us a little bit of the overview on the issue and some of the definition and the, the conceptual frameworks. Please, Marilise, the floor is all yours. So thank you very much. Uh, so commercial determinant of uh, cancer control policy. What is, uh, what is this? Um, first, let's define the commercial determinant of health. It's an evolving um, a definition, but today we will use this one. It's the private sector activity that affect the health of population. They can affect positively or negatively. So private sector, who are these people? Mainly the industry, you spoke about alcohol, tobacco, and also food industry, but the medical industry, for example, pharmaceutical company, and the one who make a machine device for medicine are a part of this, as well as medical service providers, doctors, or hospital subject to financial intensive. And we all know very well that all these people uh, do a lot of uh, beneficial things for our health. But today, we want to focus on the potential dark side of the commercial determinants and uh, the role of uh, these actors. And uh, we want to focus on, um, on cancer along the whole cancer control continuum. So what is the cancer control continuum? It's simply considering cancer from prevention. So we focus on risk factor, tobacco, alcohol, obesity, to uh, name the three main ones through uh, early detection, which includes screening, diagnosis and treatment, which means medicine, diagnosis, treatment device, machine, to palliative care, which includes supportive and end of life care. So we have to realize that cancer is really a big market because one European out of three will develop cancer in their lifetime. And what is important to know is that 30 to 40% of this cancer can be prevented. And realistically, today, uh, a third of cancer could be prevented if well-known um, and evidence-based policy were in place. But in the EU, we uh, see that it's not always the case. Actually, WHO has issued a lot of evidence-based guidance that recommend clear and cost-effective cancer policy for prevention, early detection, treatment, and palliative care. But our experience show that in country, uh, this no-brainer policy remain not enough implemented, for example, like uh, alcohol and uh, sweet beverage taxation, while some costly and not uh, very uh, useful or even harmful ones, like uh, breast cancer screening from age 40 or even colorectal cancer screening from age 35, are implemented, are super costly, and are very well reimbursed by the, the health insurance. So why is that? We try to understand. And of course, there are some knowledge barriers. For example, if a Ministry of Health, nobody knows that uh, 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 tax on uh, sweet, um, sweet beverage uh, really efficiently decrease obesity in the population, nobody will implement it. Uh, there are some culture and practice also barriers because we all know that when it's come to change uh, the way things are done um, in a complex system as a health system, it can be tough. But in many instances, um, we found out that uh, the main barriers, uh, partly or wholly, could be uh, the fact that some people protect very efficiently their uh, financial interests. And um, for example, uh, we see that uh, 
there is at the EU level a very strong push for screening, even when it's useless, even when it's harmful. You have to know that 50% uh, 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 only of the cancer can be screened for in the EU. And yet, when you look at the EU beating cancer plan, the part about early detection is all about screening. There is nothing about rapid diagnosis of, um, of cancer, which is something that is just about improving pathway, very, uh, very cheap. It's, it's not even mentioned. So there is also all this new and uh, very costly uh, treatment and technology that constantly replace the old one um, in cancer care. Even if they are not better, they are just more expensive and they get fully reimbursed. So what is the, the consequence of this? The first and main one is that the cost of cancer care is really increasing. In the last 25 years, it has just doubled as shown on these graphics. While at the same time, the, the cancer mortality was decreasing by a little 20% and was even not decreasing in some countries. And even worse, uh, patient needs are not correctly um, are some not are correctly addressed, like palliative care and social care, which remain really underdeveloped in Europe. So we have a problem. We need to understand better the role of this commercial determinant of health. And that is why WHO has reinforced its work and its focus on this. And uh, now Monica will tell us about it. Thank you so much, Marilise. And this discussion that we're having today on the commercial dynamics of cancer control sits in what is a, a very evolving and maturing global context. But cancer and the, the origins of this are, are well, very much at the heart of the, the, the start of commercial dynamics and our conceptualization of it. We, our understanding of health and the, the impact uh, on, of, the pro of commercial practices on health and, and the human costs for that is not new. And we have decades of experience, particularly in NCDs and the risk factors in, in unpicking that complexity and understanding really how those drivers of impact happen. But the evidence is showing us that the, 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 the role of commercial determinants in driving health impacts and health outcomes and health equity outcomes is only growing and becoming more important. Next slide, please. Uh, but the flip side of this is that we have to understand the role of the private sector as a multi sector or a part of for health. And again, this is not new. There's a long history of partnership with the private sector in health, and there's a breadth of evidence and experience in how to govern and, and lever the benefits and manage the conflict of interest and, and learning from amongst different areas of work. And we know that in some areas, particularly in uh, most notably perhaps in road safety, that the, the leadership of the private sector was, was critical in achieving some of our health gains of the, the recent decades. Next slide, please. So a key question for us in, this, in addressing a complex issue such as the commercial terms of cancer control is to how to navigate, how to govern and how to regulate uh, in, the, in the partnerships and the relationships, but also in terms of the indirect and perhaps more hidden aspects and, uh, and impacts. And this is very much in the spirit of the SDGs and 3.4, which I'm sure everybody knows off by heart, makes it very clear that tackling NCDs, including cancer, is critical if we want, it's essential if we want to achieve our economic and human development goals. And the role of the private sector as part of our transformative partnerships in, in this end is, is only growing in importance. And indeed, COVID highlighted in, in many areas, both the tensions, but also the opportunities that, that arise. Next slide, please. And so it's a very exciting moment for us and, and for me personally to be able to participate in the, the, the evolution of this new global program on economic and commercial determinants, which is in the social determinants department. And our goal is to reflect and integrate these two strands and support member states in really addressing and understanding the power and influence of corporate actors on health equity and health outcomes, but also in navigating the global, the growing role of the private sector in models of development. And our challenge is to understand the imp health impacts, both positive and negative, as Marilis says, but not to lose our focus on the asymmetries of power, on the role of good governance and the management of conflict of interest that we have in it. And so my, my final point, perhaps, is that the first step, next slide, please, Marilis, is that we need to understand these impacts and we need to understand the risks. I don't know if you can, <laughs> we've frozen somewhere. I'm not sure if we can get one. It's, uh, and the, if, when we get there, there we go, we find it. And we've tried to um, very simply conceptualize what that might look like. And on the one hand, you have, you know, what does the private sector do? And it does many different things. And, and of course, the private sector is not homogenous, um, catch-all. And indeed, the business functions, the development of products and services, 
the the sales retail marketing but also the role of as an employer as a as a logistic from a logistical perspective the supply chains and and so on and importantly their role in the market and then on the other hand we have the corporate citizenship function so the the personhood how the corporate actor engages in the public discourse and that could be csr public relations but also political activities lobbying tax contributions even, and also third party organizations through, for example, business associations. And it's through delineating the functions, we can then also start to look at the impacts, direct impacts on, on the environments, physical, social, behavioral, cultural, but also on regulatory systems and processes. So thank you very much. And I, I will pass back to Mary Lise. Sorry for the mess up in the slide. I have a new computer that's yet strangely. So anyway, uh, today we want to motivate you to read this uh, special issue of the Euro Health uh, Journal on commercial determinant of cancer control policy. And this special issue contains eight articles. Uh, one, on one on prevention, one on screening, two on treatment, uh, one on palliative care, and two cross-cutting ones. And uh, we have asked very brilliant mind to make uh, to write all this article. And uh, very lucky you, you have three of these extremely brilliant mind today with us, uh, Gordon, Stuart, and uh, Richard. So I will give, give them the floor. Thank you very much. Marilise and Monica, thank you so much for this excellent and insightful overview and setting the scene so effectively for, for today. Just to re-emphasize a couple of messages you brought across. First of all, Marilise, you were very clear we are talking today about the dark side of the commercial determinants of health. It's not to be negative about commercial activities or something like this. It's rather zooming in on what goes really wrong and how can we remedy this actually. And actually you also gave the bridge for Monica because some of your your presentation was on the clash between evidence-based public health and service provision on one hand and commercial interest stakeholder power uh, on the on the other hand and monica you have looked into this uh, from a very systematic point with these four different uh, quadrants where we actually need to fully understand you know where is the commercial uh, determinants actually taking place where's the impact actually um, uh, taking uh, place thank you so much for um, for this. So um, that was our um, keynote, and I would like now to ask my colleague Erica to present the results of the poll. Erica. Hello, everybody. Yes, um, thank you very much uh, for all your results. I'm just going to share them on the screen now. So, yes, I'm very sorry to those of you for whom the poll didn't work. We're going to run some technical tests after us to find out what went wrong there. But we did get um, 63 answers. So, um, interestingly, the commercial determinants of cancer prevention aren't widely recognised in over half of the uh, countries that are represented here, according to respondents. Um, but the, when, it, when we look at the commercial determinants of cancer control um, and how they're being tackled in countries, most focus is on alcohol and tobacco which is uh, logical and I'm really glad that uh, that's something that Gauden's going to be talking about in a bit. But then screening is also widely recognised, um, the commercial determinants in screening and cancer medicines, but less so in non-pharmaceutical treatments. So some really interesting results there and I think it's uh, going to be uh, really interesting in, in, as it relates to the spotlight speakers coming up now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Erica, for this um, overview. And one thing I forgot to mention um, after Monica's um, uh, presentation, I think that's key. That's something we need to bear in mind is that um, better control, be better cancer control uh, with regards to the commercial determinants of uh, um, uh, health. I think it's also with it has to do with the private public partnership, as Monica mentioned. So thank you so much. And we now go straight to our first uh, spotlight speaker, Gauden Gallia. Gauden, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Matthias, and all the, the speakers. Thank you all. Um, it's my great pleasure, despite the technical hiccup, um, to be presenting here. Uh, Lea, my co-author, is in the audience. Uh, hat tip to you. Also to Karina, who was an advisor um, on this paper. Um, a very rapid overview. Next, please. 
it, there's a whole range of carcinogens um, and they are so many of them are reviewed uh, on the by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Um, this paper has focused on tobacco and alcohol, but as you can see from this uh, fairly uh, personal selection of covers uh, from over 100 such reviews, um, we have decided to focus on tobacco and alcohol. And I'm very happy to see that the poll reflected the importance of those, but this is not to say that the other uh, areas are not equally uh, or at least uh, deserving of importance, nor that the tactics that we will be looking at um, are confined to tobacco and alcohol. Indeed, the point we make in the paper is that many industries across many areas of the origins of, of the causation of cancer um, are using similar techniques. Next, please. And this has been uh, discussed in uh, multiple texts. Um, uh, Freudenberg's Lethal But Legal, it, for those who are new to the field of commercial determinants, is a great introduction about this connection between corporations, consumption, and the state responsibility to protect public health, or uh, Jonathan Mark's uh, more recent uh, book on uh, the perils of partnership. We've already spoken about public-private public, public partnerships. Um, uh, uh, Jonathan requires us or requests that we think twice about uh, doing that and, and set the ground rules, as we shall re-emphasize later in this presentation. Next, please. So um, a classic picture of the commercial determinants comes from this paper by uh, Kikbo Shatal. By the way, the uh, QR codes take you directly to the sources. This, this diagram is an adaptation of that, uh, of their figure and it describes the broad overview of, of how the causal sequence of uh, commercial determinants operates in society, the broad trends that drive uh, the market forces, the channels that companies use to exert influence and power, and the outcomes on the environment, consumers, and health. Next, please. Our own paper inserts a plea for a strong emphasis among public health advocates on the tactics that are used by uh, these companies. Uh, we use the alliterative list of fear fronts, funds, denial, deflection, and division for the, the, the symmetry of, of, their, uh, of the alliteration. But at the same time, we do not make a claim that this is the full list of tactics that are used. Next, please. It's worth though to see how they, and next, uh, the, worth though to see how they operate. <clears throat> Fear is uh, when companies uh, try to uh, exert uh, power over the state. Uh, in this case, for example, the famous tobacco control suit uh, against Uruguay, uh, trying to um, drive, to scare politicians against taking effective legal action um, or regulatory action against their products. Um, the size of companies being so much larger than many economies means that the fear of litigation is a very important mode of exerting power. Next, please. A more insidious mode is when the companies go bottom up. Um, uh, as there are so many front groups um, that have uh, spoken for or purported to speak for uh, as NGOs for civil society or indeed for other industries such as hospitality uh, industry that speak for tobacco and alcohol in ways that make the, the point uh, for those other industries but serve effectively um, as front groups. Next, please. The size of these industries makes their 
corporate social responsibility within quotes efforts quite extensive and 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 can be used as a way uh, to whitewash or greenwash uh, the activities uh, of of marketing and the harm that is done by their products and in the era of covid we've seen uh, for example uh, this uh, the the uh, dominance of some campaigns such as this one by Anheuser Busch um, giving away beers for people who were reluctant or uh, hesitant about vaccination this uh, uh, this shot and beer combo uh, as referred to in this fortune article is simply an example of many similar examples in the air in the area of sports culture um, civil society at large and more recently in covid next please one of the oldest techniques um, that uh, has been used by initially the tobacco industry is that of denial, denial of the harm of tobacco, denial of the addictiveness uh, of nicotine uh, being two examples. Next, please. But it's been also uh, a, uh, a technique that has been used in multiple industries, and one could uh, almost call it the weaponization of doubt. And we see much of the uh, doubt about science, the anti-science movement, um, probably having origins in the denialism that the tobacco industry started decades ago. Next, please. Deflection um, is when the companies uh, try to uh, to somehow mask the effect of their products and deflect interest on onto another area. The in the era of COVID, there's a whole new area of um, a, a whole new area of distraction uh, that has been used. Uh, the alcohol industry has been shown to be using. Um, the solidarity that there was, especially in the early times of COVID, we're in this together to use, next please, to use moments of social distancing, lockdown and isolation as moments when you could do things like um, hoard alcohol, hold online drinking parties, or if you followed this uh, Jacob's Creek advert, learn how to taste wine like a professional. Next please. Even more complex and difficult is the technique, uh, the tactic of division. Um, uh, and I quickly allude here to two examples, uh, the foundation for a smoke-free world um, that has a tobacco company uh, purporting to uh, be working for tobacco control and dividing in many ways the tobacco control community. This is a, a, a screenshot from their current grant uh, opportunities that are available, dividing the science, or controlling the language. Um, and it can be argued that the tobacco in the, the alcohol industry has been behind the insistence by member states to use the harmful use of alcohol, um, the word harmful, implying that there's a beneficial use. Next. As you read our paper, uh, you may be asking the so what? Um, and two quick points. The, the, the emphasis of tactics suggests that we should be studying formally the industry playbooks across industries. And I am honored that Mike Dobb is in the audience, uh, one of the principal authors um, of this online resource. Sec next, please. And of course, uh, we have to uh, not enter any public private partnerships naively. Um, we should be finding ways of uh, setting strong ground rules. And dare I say, not only cautious, but suspicious um, about uh, any offer of partnership. Uh, next, please. But for more, you'll have to read the paper. Thank you very much.
Odin, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. I think it was really the playbook of the dark side of the commercial determinants of cancer control. And you also made crystal clear that we need to look into each commercial um, agent separately in terms of understanding, can we partner with them? Is there any space for improving with them together or is regulation the only way, way um, forward? Thanks a lot. We are now coming to our second um, uh, speaker, um, Stuart Hoggart from the University of Cambridge. Please, Stuart. Um, what is screening? Testing people who are asymptomatic in order to identify those who are at risk of a disease and to provide them with follow-up interventions. The concept of early detection of disease is very attractive. There's a strong belief in the benefits of this form of secondary prevention. However, the assumption of benefits is often not supported by evidence. Screening creates harms and often harms outweigh benefits. Most recently concerns about harms have often focused on the concept of overdiagnosis, which has become a major research area in the last two decades. Now, the recognition of the potential harms of screening was first given systematic consideration in 1968 in a WH report by Wilson and Junger. This report set out the need for thorough evaluation of screening interventions, provided a framework of criteria that screening interventions should meet before they're introduced, and it emphasised the idea that screening should be organised as population programmes. And what we saw in the years following that guideline was that new governance bodies were formed in countries like the States, Canada, the UK, elsewhere in Europe subsequently, uh, formed to evaluate screening interventions and to deliver organised screening programmes. At the same time, the idea that screening should be evaluated using randomised control trials became more established. So it's important to note that despite the growing scepticism about the benefits of screening, large amounts of public funding continue to go into research to develop new screening interventions, as exemplified by the transnational collaboration, the uh, Alliance for Cancer Early Detection. And as well as public money going into uh, new tools for uh, screening early detection of cancer, we're seeing a huge amount of commercial interest in the potential profitable uh, profits to be generated in uh, cancer screening. So although the first generation of screening tools, things like uh, mammography and the PAP test for cervical screening, were developed in the public sector, increasingly what we're seeing is that it's the private sector that is driving innovation today, especially in the development of new genomic-based uh, diagnostics. And this is exemplified by the Silicon Valley-based firm Grail, who raised the quite extraordinary sum of $1 billion in its first year. Uh, its competitor, Freenome, uh, has also raised over a billion dollars, including major investments from Roche, who are the world's leading uh, largest in vitro diagnostics firm. So we're seeing huge amounts of private investment going into development of new uh, screening tools for cancer. Uh, and these major investments are being made in anticipation of very substantial returns. And the corporate drive for profits is underpinned by major investments in marketing of new tools. So this is part of a more general increase uh, in medical marketing. Uh, so from 1997 to 2016, marketing on drugs, disease awareness campaigns, health services and laboratory testing nearly doubled from 17.7 billion dollars to 29.9 billion dollars. The number of direct to consumer ads for laboratory tests increased from 14,100 to 255,300, reflecting the, the very cheap cost of internet-based advertising. Uh, and test manufacturers paid over $12 million to medical professionals in 2016. So there's a lot of corporate money going into marketing new technologies. 
And what we're seeing with the new generation of molecular screening tools is that the diagnostics firms who are introducing these tools have adopted the pharmaceutical industry's marketing strategies. So we're seeing recruitment of key opinion leaders, people who often sit on clinical guideline bodies, uh, but more generally promote new tests, physician detailing, so going direct into doctor's offices to uh, market uh, new tests, direct to consumer advertising, as well as astroturfing, so the funding of non-governmental organizations for supposedly independent advocacy. Um, so in the USA, for instance, nearly all the clinical, early clinical guidelines that endorsed HPV testing for cervical screening had heavy, heavy representation from key opinion leaders with financial links to Digene, the firm that had introduced uh, HPV testing in the USA. If we look at the present day, and colorectal screening, the new multi-marker DNA test introduced by the firm Exact Sciences, we can see the huge amounts of money that Exact Sciences are now spending on marketing, which includes things like direct to consumer advertising, vastly outstripping uh, their spending on research and development. So when we look at this um, commercial push, the um, broad array of marketing activities, the, the huge amount of money that's going into this, then uh, in terms of the policy uh, response, we need to identify the links between industry and the advocates for new technologies and professional bodies and patient charities. We need to be aware that those who are participating in the development of clinical guidelines may have financial links with industry. We need to look at the regulation of industry marketing, in particular scrutiny of claims that firms are making for their tests. And we need to be aware that often the most effective form of marketing for industry is positive media coverage. And we need to do a better job of talking to science correspondents, health correspondents, to ensure that they are providing balanced messages about the harms and the benefits of uh, new screening technologies. But I want to talk as well about how corporate influence is linked to a broader problem, which I term cultural yep. ca capture. One more slide, please. OK. So there is a huge amount of enthusiasm for uh, genomics and in particular gene sequencing. And in the UK, you can see that um, exemplified by three recent initiatives in the last year. We're facing the uh, pilot of, of uh, GRAILS multi-cancer screening test, um, a push for whole genome sequencing of newborns, and polygenic risk scores for cardiovascular disease. So these are being promoted by government bodies, Genomics England and the Office for uh, Life Sciences. And what this means is that governance bodies, in this case, the UK National Screening Committee, are beginning to face more intense pressure from more powerful actors and actors who are acting across the public and the private sectors. So there's a combination of both industry and cultural capture that is beginning to shape the potential future of screening for cancer, uh, in, uh, uh, particularly in, in high income countries. Thank you. Stuart, thank you so much for this um, very good and actually all very unsettling uh, presentation, because if I understand correctly, actually our system of creating innovations in uh, screening is, is, is kind of broken. And we see a case of corporate capture that the public health criteria and policies are actually quite ignored. And I think that is very much the dark side of the um, commercial determinants um, of uh, cancer. So thank you so thank you so much for this one. And now I would like to uh, invite our third spotlight speaker, Richard Salison from King's College. Richard, the floor is all yours. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen from uh, Guy's Hospital in London. Um, it's a great pleasure to share with you on behalf of my two co-authors a very brief overview of the two papers we were asked to contribute around the commercial determinants of non-pharmaceutical technologies and cancer medicines. Let me firstly introduce you to my co-authors. Professor Chris Booth is at Queen's University in Toronto, in um, Toronto in Kingston, in Canada, and is a consultant medical oncologist. And Dr. Ajay Agarwal is a consultant clinical oncologist here at the Institute of Cancer Policy at Guy's Hospital at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. All of them are experts in different types and areas of the subjects we were dealing with. We split the papers in two, mainly because the policy issues surrounding cancer medicine systemic therapies 
are very different when it comes to commercial determinants from those with non-pharmaceutical technologies. And by non-pharmaceutical technologies, I'm talking of surgical technologies like the Da Vinci robots, technologies used for radiotherapy, imaging, diagnostic tele technologies, all the way through to new software around algorithms for the AI-driven revolution we're seeing. So this is a very wide piece we're, we're looking at. I have one slide really to talk you through the main areas of overlap that we dealt with. The first is to make the point that all evidence coming from both non-pharmaceutical and pharmaceutical technologies points to the fact that we'd have a value crisis. And by that, we mean that technology advancement is becoming disconnected from delivering better outcomes, be that improvements in quality of life or improvements in survival or reductions in mortality. This is driving inequalities. It's also driving a serious issue around affordability in healthcare systems. And it's not to say that we have, don't have some amazing technologies that have come through. There are cancer medicines which have been truly revolutionary. We have non-pharmaceutical technologies which have been truly revolutionary. But sadly, these revolutionary innovations are uh, unfortunately a bit of a drift into in a sea of what I consider to be mediocrity. Um, the issue of the value crisis has been well articulated in, across Europe and, and indeed across all high income countries and increasingly in middle income countries. But what are the drivers? The first is, as Stuart mentioned, that there's a cultural change. The clinical research ecosystems have dramatically changed over the twi 20, last 20 to 30 years to be much more commercially aligned. It's all about speed of delivery of innovations now, not their effectiveness and efficacy. And because of that, we've seen a huge rise in the use of surrogates, for instance, in clinical research. So progression-free survival has particularly been misused when overall survival should be the end point and or quality of life improvements. Um, again, a tremendous amount of research, which we reflect in the papers, looking at the rise of surrogates and how this is pushing more and more technologies, be pharmaceutical or NMPs through to the market, which have greater and greater levels of uncertainty of their true benefit and toxicity. We also see, of course, the drivers around the political commercial nexus. Um, let's be blunt, cancer technologies are worth a great deal of money. Um, the revenue for cancer pharmaceuticals over the last decade for the top 10 countries is increased by 70% to just under 100 billion a year, some work we did last year and published. So there's an enormous financial driver across the board now for technologies in cancer. But there's also assumption, of course, that we can deal with these uncertainties through better real world data. I'm afraid that's not true. When we've looked at this, the 293 real world data studies in the last 10 years that have been published in 45 drug, drug indications, 80% were of such poor quality that they were useless for guiding clinical practice or policy. So on the one hand, we have these huge commercial drivers to get through new technologies into the market with the assumption that downstream in terms of real world data, we will be able to deal with the uncertainty, but the reality is that's not happening. So that divergence is really quite acute. And the point we make in both papers is that we're really hitting what we call the break even point. Although effective innovation is needed still in lots of areas, the reality is across the board in cancer, effective innovation is less important than increasing the fidelity to which all these technologies are delivered. And by that, we mean the second translational gap, how technologies are embedded in health services and how, health, how these technologies are embedded in our systems overall. And this speaks to the need, of course, for health policy and services research, and it tours to a completely different research agenda. And one of the things we reflect on, of course, very heavily is that the research agenda, particularly in the public sector, has become completely aligned behind commercial interests. So basic discovery, work that's entirely developed on the biopharmaceutical model, and it's leaving other areas in heavily orphaned territory, be that health services research, palliative care, areas of non-commercial interest in surgery or radiotherapy. And that's a massive issue because, of course, it speaks to the problem of distorted research agendas and therefore downstream impacts on improving population and patient outcomes. So what are the solutions? Well, we, we talk about five major solutions. First, 
realigning the public sector research agenda and integrating socioeconomic studies. The second, countering the hype culture, which is highly prevalent in our media and in the way we talk about the benefits of these new technologies. Thirdly, it is about outcomes refocused national cultures. The only way to really determine the benefit, particularly in these complex pathways of care of all these different technologies, is to have national audits. And that really speaks to moving beyond what we currently have at the moment. Fourthly, higher regulatory barriers and indeed better health technology barriers assessments for all technologies, not pharmaceuticals. And finally, a much better pricing and costing agenda that's actually pro-value rather than pro-corporate. And thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen, and hand back to the chair. Richard, thank you so much. Again, a bit of a gloomy presentation, actually, when I think about, you know, all the non-pharmaceutical technologies you've been talking about. But at the same time, there's a glimmer of hope, you know, because uh, you already pointed to a couple of um, solutions which could if effectively implemented be a very good way to, to regulate actually these markets, this, these markets and the commercial determinants of health, realigning public sector research agenda. We are fighting for this in Europe for, for ages, actually, to put more money into health systems and services research. Hype culture, we need much more health literacy with the media, of course. National audits, HTA and pricing regimes, I think this, uh, this really rings a bell for many, many, many people. So thank you so much, Richard, and I would like to ask you and all the other um, speakers now to join our panel because Erica, my colleague, has already brought together a couple of questions from the chat box. And uh, Erica, please feed them back to the panelists and um, please only only answer to those questions you feel you're best suited to answer. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, quite quite a busy chat box. Um, so, but the lots of questions around. Uh, sort of personalized medicine, genomics, that sort of thing. Um, and what are the challenges and opportunities here, realistically? Is it is it going to deliver on the big promises that have been made? Um, there was also a very interesting uh, comment about the use of gender empowerment by tobacco and alcohol industry, and whether anybody wants to talk about, uh, talk about that. Um, question probably specifically for Richard, but open to everybody, which is around if real world studies are not so useful, uh, what should we be doing instead? Um, and uh, are we really talking about the commercial determinants of health or are we talking about the commercial determinants of disease? So thank you so much, question. Erica. Uh, quite a lot of uh, interesting uh, questions coming through the chat box. Um, I have to ask you all to be very brief in your um, responses because uh, time is a limiting factor here today. Um, Gordon, would, I don't know, I, I would like to ask you, Marilis, to start and then Monica, Gordon, um, Stuart and Richard. Marilis. <laughs> Uh, I will be brief. I just pick up on the one on uh, genomic promises as a geneticist by background, uh, like uh, most of the, the students in my uh, in my generation. We did genetics, genomics. That was the big uh, the big thing. And I must say that I quit because uh, I saw huge investment in this. And uh, 25 years later, because I did my PhD quite a long time ago, um, all what we were working on has not delivered. So in my experience, has, has delivered very, very few. So there is clearly what Richard was speaking about, the hype, you know, the, but uh, be careful about this, uh, this that costs fortunes. And, you know, with, with some experience now, it has not delivered as much as we were told when I chose to go in genetics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marilis. I think we are not only seeing this hype in, uh, in health uh, research and uh, health commercial determinants, but also another, you know, so just the fusion reactor was bringing to my mind. Monica, please. Thank you very much. And I'll also be brief. I wanted to, to just touch briefly on the, the discussion of, of what do we call it? Is this really commercial determinants of health or is it commercial determinants of disease? And I think this is that as we are, you know, although on the one hand it may seem, uh, ultimately we have been talking about the, this, um, this area of work, even if we did not have a title that we could capture all of it for quite some time, 
But I think having uh, one of the values of the journal when looking at commercial determinants from the lens of a particular outcome, in this case, of course, is cancer, and one of the most important um, in terms of high impact outcomes that we have, is that it allows us to move into the granularity of what we're talking about. Commercial determinants is such a broad, all-encompassing area that, that tackles uh, the, the whole breadth of our public health spectrum bringing that disease lens into it. In particular, I think what we've done here and what's the, the excellent contributions that we've had from colleagues, both on the panel, but also those who are not with us today. Um, I think it allows us to start to, uh, to mature this conversation and really understand uh, where those impacts and risks lie. And therefore, of course, the next step is to support the policy response to that. So I, so I, I do, although uh, it, uh, you know, semantics is not one of my favorites of areas to engage in, I do think it is an important um, uh, evolution, if you like, in terms of the lens. You muted in yourself, this, but I, I did with my elbow, but I was done anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much. You got much. so agitated, you know. I did. Very good. So Thank you so much, Monica. Great. Uh, Gordon, please. So I'll, I'll quickly address um, the issue of um, targeting of, uh, of women. Uh, so gender equality, um, uh, an issue, uh, we have to understand uh, that uh, most of the tobacco and alcohol smoking in the world is a male behavior. Um, and that in most countries, women are uh, are um, a smaller market, uh, or at least up to now, a smaller group of consumers. So both tobacco and alcohol have, uh, since decades, seen women as a growth market, um, and and therefore uh, we must be very conscious of any effort that they make. Um, uh, Virginia Slims in the old days, you've come a long way, baby. So um, uh, slogans that are decades old, targeting women, uniting themselves with uh, feminist causes, with gender equality, um, but in reality, combining that with other marketing techniques uh, ranging from uh, flavors and colors of packaging and <clears throat> slim cigarettes um, that are directly targeting women um, as consumers. And the same is happening in alcohol in my uh, duty station in China. Um, uh, there is a very conscious targeting of the urban educated woman by uh, specific uh, uh, wine companies. Uh, because they drink alcohol or used to drink alcohol very rarely, and now alcohol is becoming much more common within that population. Um, I would simply interpret uh, work or advocacy for gender equity by, smoke, by tobacco and alcohol industry as another instance of, um, of deflection um, and, uh, and the appropriation of another cause in the service of marketing. Over. Gordon, thank you so much. And thank you so much also for reminding us actually uh, that uh, industry and the commercial uh, de determinants uh, of cancer control are a global issue. You know, some, some gains on our side in Europe may be compensated by losses in other parts of the world, as you just have illustrated. And we will not only need to act in the national or European context, but I think globally, that's, that's really very much key. Thank you so much. So the next speaker, where, 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 I can't see you actually, uh, Stuart, where are you? I'm here. There oh, you are. So, so the, the promise of personalized medicine, is it ever going to be realized? Um, so I would um, split this in two and I would begin by thinking about germline DNA. So the DNA we inherit from our mums and dads and the idea of genetic risk assessment. And, you know, we have to face the fact that in terms of established uh, genetic risk assessment programs like um, screening for uh, the BRCA genes in high risk populations, we still don't have robust trial evidence that that intervention improves clinical uh, outcomes. Uh, but putting that to one side, any attempts to broaden out 
um, uh, say for instance, uh, through the use of polygenic risk assessment is very problematic. We don't have a scientific consensus on how to do polygenic risk scores. And again, we have absolutely no evidence that that kind of risk-based approach could improve screening uh, early detection uh, of cancer. So I, I would be quite skeptical uh, about the, the potential germline DNA. Um, and you know, we need decent trials to demonstrate that the, uh, this can improve outcomes. And then on the kind of other side of things, companies like Grail, companies like Exact Sciences, who are more, uh, whose tests are based on somatic DNA gene expression, or maybe even uh, proteomics or metabolomics. We've been studying um, 30 companies across prostate cancer, across colorectal cancer, uh, across uh, lung cancer. There's been a huge amount of investment in the last 20 years. Most of these technologies have got nowhere near demonstrating improved clinical outcomes. Many of the firms have gone bust before they've got uh, anywhere near that. So we see a huge amount of commercial hype. And as regards the new wave of companies who have large amounts of investment behind them, companies like Freenome and Grail, um, we just need to be very skeptical and we just need to demand that there is no adoption ahead of RCT data that shows improved uh, clinical outcomes. Um, and I'm very concerned in the UK that we have gone down the route of saying we are gonna pilot uh, the Grail test with uh, kind of a lot of publicity suggesting that this is a precursor to rollout um, when the test doesn't seem to perform that well based on uh, current data and there are competing products if we were to do a trial, then it should be a head to head of the competing products, not getting into bed with one company who happens to be kind of now uh, yep. acquired by Illumina. Anyway, okay. Yeah, th thank you so much. I think what you just described is quite a challenge for society because we are also hungry for effective uh, tests. And at the same time, we need to be very skeptical vis-a-vis -vis what is actually happening and, and developing. Oh, I'm sorry, just what, I, one other thing, which is even where we- Very briefly, see, Stuart. Yeah, even when we've seen molecular tests entering the clinic and I've used yeah. the example HPV and cervical screening, yeah. the benefits over the established technology are That's relatively awesome. modest. It's not transformative. Thanks. So even where we introduce it, the hype is wrong. Thanks a lot. Now I could listen to you all, all uh, afternoon actually but our time has come uh, to our webinar has come to its end and i would like to ask marilis and monica for the wrap up just very briefly two or three messages you would like to bring across uh, i saw two chat when uh, asking about solution and i think uh, richard gave some but uh, you there is a full article in the um, in the special issue about this so please read it and um, for, for the rest, uh, I think uh, I will let uh, Monica conclude. Thank you so much, Marilis. And I, I'm not going to take much more of our time. So just uh, to say, this is definitely not the end of the conversation. This is just the beginning. The, the global work has started only last year and will continue in force. We have a, a global conference planned and the global report on commercial determinants of which cancer, of course, and the drivers of cancer is, is going to be an important part of it. Uh, and with regards, to, just to say thank you very much to, to all of our panelists and our participants, Marilise, our co-editors, um, Tit and uh, um, and Jose, Mar uh, Jose Martin Moreno, and of course, all of the contributions at the observatory as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, time is over. Thank you, and uh, good luck, and hope to see you all soon. Bye bye. Take care. Mm -hmm.